Great, thank you all so much for joining us today. We are really excited to share with you folks who are here live and who might be watching the recording later. Um, we're excited to share with you a new position we have at Willamette Partnership, and we're so excited to grow our team. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about WP, about the work, and also this is gonna be an opportunity for you to meet some of our um, staff here. We actually have just about 50% of our team here today. So uh, hopefully you'll get a little taste of what it's like to work with us and, and the team here. Um, so I'm Lenny Brown. I use she and her pronouns. I'm one of the health and outdoors partners here at Willamette Partnership. I get to work on a variety of projects related to um, the environment and health from connecting young children uh, to the outdoors, all the way to water justice and um, water policy work. Um, <clears throat> outside of work, I do a lot of things too. I'm really proud because over the last few years, I've been learning to ski. I grew up somewhere with no snow. Um, and as many of you know, skiing is pretty inaccessible, scary, expensive. So I've been really grateful to organizations that have helped bring new folks outside to the mountains and to the slopes. So um, a couple more weeks left of ski season here in the Portland area. And I'm really, really excited about that. Um, a couple of logistical things before we get started here. Um, so we are in a webinar format, which means you shouldn't be able to see anyone else in the room today. Um, to protect your, your anonymity, we uh, ask that you use the Q&A function. Um, that way we'll see your name, but we won't share your name when we're asking questions. If you leave a comment in the chat, we will see your name. So, so just giving you a heads up there, you can either change your name or just use the Q&A function and that will remain confidential. Um, and uh, I think that is pretty much it. If you have questions, please, go ahead and type that during the conversation and then we'll address all the questions at the end of the presentation today. All right, so I'll go ahead and, and share what we'll be talking about. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna learn a little bit about WP, Willamette Partnership, who we are and how we work. Uh, we'll learn more about what the job is that we're, we're hiring for and what projects look like, what is the day-to-day -day work. Um, We'll talk a little bit about the kinds of people we're looking for and who would do well in our organization. And then we'll finally talk a little bit about work culture benefits and then open it up to, to Q&A at the very end. I'm really excited to be joined by my colleagues here today, Emily Irish, Barton Robison, and Ethan Brown. Um, and they'll introduce themselves a little bit more as we go on. Okay, so um, to start us off, I'd like to introduce Emily Irish. Who will talk a little bit about Willamette Partnership. And Emily, before you get started, do you mind sharing a little introduction, your role, um, and something you like to do outside of work as well? Yeah, thank you so much, Lenny. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Emily Irish. I'm our partner in communications at WP. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and something I like to do outside of work is uh, crafting and textiles. I own a small table loom that's sitting on the floor next to me and lots of yarn is in my life. So that is something I enjoy doing outside of all of my work with Malamet Partnership. Um, just for a quick introduction about the partnership, um, for those of you who may not be as familiar with us or want a quick refresher, uh, Willamette Partnership is a conservation nonprofit based in Portland, but we work across the American West um, with a commitment to building stronger, uh, healthier and more equitable communities that are sustained by nature. Uh, our work spans over three program areas, uh, working lands conservation, health in the outdoors, and infrastructure next, which we'll be diving into a bit more today uh, with this position. Um, we approach our work through a collaborative lens. So we're bringing together partners across multiple sectors, boundaries, and backgrounds to work collaboratively together uh, in hopes of building an innovative solution that benefits both people and nature. Um, our staff vary in strengths um, and the skill sets of the technical expertise that we bring to the table. Uh, that can include anything from natural resource policy to water management, uh, environmental justice to public health lens. Uh, this makes our approach to the facilitation and collaborative convening work that we do 
um, and a lot of the problem solving that we do a lot more holistic as we work together on difficult and challenging uh, projects together. Um, I'll share a quick link in chat for everyone here a little bit more about our collaborative model if you want to dive into that a bit more. Um, but for now, I'll hand it over to Linny and Ethan to talk more about this position and our day to day work. Awesome. Thanks, Emily. Um, so what's the job? Hopefully all of you have seen the job posting for Community Water Solutions. Uh, there's a pretty thorough description and, you know, we're looking for someone to um, find sustainable water solutions for small, low income rural um, communities and other communities that have experienced inequity under the current approaches to infrastructure and to conservation. Um, this person will lead and support projects related to water infrastructure from stormwater to drinking water to wastewater um, and even natural infrastructure. Um, and I do want to acknowledge that uh, the job description looks like a lot. There's a lot of skills that we're looking for, a lot of background we're looking for. And um, the reason for that is there's a lot of combinations that could work for this position. We have um, a, a suite of projects coming up this next year, but as this new hire grows into the role, there's just a lot of opportunity to grow um, the program in the way that meets your skills, your interests, and, and the talents that you bring. Um, so there's a lot of combinations that I think could work really well for this position, and that's why the description shows a lot of different things. So just wanted to call that out explicitly. Uh, so for example, if you bring a lot of expertise or interest in policy work, that is something that can grow out. If your experience is in natural infrastructure implementation, that's something that could be grown out in the future. And um, if your background is more in community organizing, then maybe we can find projects that really focus on um, building community and working from the ground up. Um, <clears throat> so you don't need to have all the combinations of the things listed in the job description, um, but the job description describes some of the things that we are looking for. Um, and I think oh, we'll post in the chat too, Emily, if you don't mind helping me posting the job description um, just to make sure you all can see it. It's pretty thorough, um, but we want to spend today talking a little bit more uh, what it looks like on the day-to-day -day and what are some potential projects you could be working on. So Ethan works a lot with our Infrastructure Next program, and Ethan, I was hoping you could describe a little bit about the projects you're working on, what this new hire could potentially be working on, um, and also sharing a little bit about yourself too, your title and your uh, and something you like to do outside of work as well. Thanks, Lenny. Yeah, um, thanks for being here, everyone. Um, sorry that we can't see your faces. Uh, so it's, if we seem kind of informal, it's because we see each other a lot and we're talking to each other and we're the only faces that we see. But um, a little bit about myself, I'm Ethan Brown, uh, Infrastructure Next partner here at Willem Partnership. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I work with communities and larger regional collaboratives at the watershed scale around their water, their relationship with water um, through their infrastructure, their stormwater drinking and wastewater infrastructure. And as for things I like to do outside of work, um, I have a five month old baby, so he takes up pretty much all my time, but we like to go on walks. Uh, he's starting to laugh, which is hysterically funny to watch, um, but he's really cute. So, you know, all that time makes it easy. Um, so what does the work look like? Um, one of the reasons we wanted to host this uh, webinar on the job posting is that we realized that this job, honestly, like a lot of our jobs at Women Partnership, is fairly unique. So you probably don't see a lot of this type of job pop up uh, here and there. And so one way for us to help ground all of you in what the day-to-day -day looks like is to share the approach that we take here at the job uh, through the Infrastructure Next program and the team and list some of the projects that we work on. So to begin with, uh, Infrastructure Next, it's not only a program uh, here at Willamette Partnership, it's also an approach. So it begins with an understanding that infrastructure is often the most expensive use of public funds by a city or a county or in conjunction, multiple jurisdictions. So many places need these big expenditures to be doing more than just solving one specific issue. They, 
they needed to be addressing multiple needs of the community. So our goal is to help that community figure out how these big projects can address multiple water challenges and additional benefits that the community can yield for its public health, uh, the environment, and its economy. Uh, the approach isn't rocket science. It's literally just taking a more comprehensive and thoughtful approach to the typical infrastructure planning process where usually a city finds out it's got an issue, uh, like let's say uh, the wastewater treatment plant is at capacity or a pipe's about to burst and uh, they reach out to an engineering firm, do an RFP, engineering firm bids on it, says this is one of two options you can do. The city implements one, usually the cheapest one, and that's uh, what's implemented. And they can spend millions of dollars in that process without the community necessarily really being a part of the, the solution. And so our approach brings the community in. We try to include community visioning, identifying what they value and what are the needs that they have, and then broadening out that list of potential solutions um, beyond just infrastructure. It could include policy change or programmatic services or natural infrastructure in addition to gray infrastructure. And because we're looking at non-traditional solutions often, these communities sometimes need specialized technical assistance to help them implement them because Traditional solutions have a very easy glide path to implementation and non-traditional ones sometimes need assistance around funding or policy change or administrative barriers at the um, provider level, like with the local public uh, service, uh, public works department or across jurisdictions, things like that. Um, and I should note that this is like an idealized model of how you would implement it from start to finish. And that often is not the case. Often we work with a community that's at a different stage in the process and we may be providing implementation support because they have a really cool idea and they just need help figuring it out or maybe we do some process design and some community engagement and another group runs with it afterwards um, over time uh, those of us working on infrastructure next projects have sought to maximize the impact of our work by providing the capacity that we have to support communities that need it, need it the most. So we prioritize supporting communities preparing for and recovering from climate change impacts. So for example, we've started working with two different fire affected communities this past fall. We'll be working with them for at least a year, uh, hopefully longer, because uh, the recovery just takes so long. Um, and we'll also be focusing on working with communities that have experienced a history of disinvestment, like majority Latino communities and food picking and processing areas and tribal communities. That's a little bit of a background about the program team uh, that this position will mostly doing a lot of work within, um, but we thought it'd be helpful to provide some examples of watershed scale and community scale projects that we're undertaking right now that this position may or may not work on. So this is a map of Yaquina Bay on the coast of Oregon. Um, we are helping, uh, a group of folks uh, update their Yaquina Bay Estuary Management Plan. So we're in partnership with the University of Oregon um, in support of this plan update. Um, the, the plan, all the uh, estuaries across the coast of Oregon have estuary management plans and they dictate the activities and the development in and on the shores of the bay. And there are three jurisdictions that will be adopting the plan update. And they sit on a steering committee alongside a state agency, um, the Confederate Tribe of Sluts Indians, and the local ports. So we're convening that steering committee, the advisory group. We have a technical subgroup, making sure that we have the right, amount of, the right data and we're describing it in the right ways and taking the right insights out of it. Um, it's a fairly complex project that involves a lot of plan making, stakeholder engagement, regulatory analysis, and really being familiar, becoming familiar with the landscape um, across this massive area and all of the related uses and activities that happen in and around the bay, from recreational crabbing to um, the fact that anglers there do all of their fishing pretty much out of kayaks now instead of on the shore. So all these things you have to like learn about to help you uh, understand how people use the bay so the update can best serve them. At the day-to-day -day level, uh, it's a lot of coordination with dozens of organizations, process design of how exactly do we undertake this plan update, and crafting and delivering presentations, and a lot of facilitation. And that's like probably one of the sweet spots of our organization is we're really good at facilitation, and uh, we have a lot of internal capacity building to help people build out their uh, facilitation skill sets. Uh, it's a good example of a project where being really flexible on where it goes and um, 
uh, addressing different challenges along the way is a big benefit. So at the community scale, um, if you wanna go to the next slide, Lenny. Ah, Mill City, Oregon. So at the community scale, we're supporting the city of Mill City in updating their storm drainage master plan. Um, I don't know who's on this call, but if you're familiar with North Santiam Canyon, which is east of uh, the city of Salem, um, that area was hit hard by the 2020 Labor Day fires. Um, Mill City lost about 10% of their structures, but a lot of their neighboring communities like Gates and Detroit lost 90% of their structures and homes. And because Mill City was mostly spared and it was one of the larger cities in the area, a lot of those displaced residents from the neighboring communities are looking to relocate in Mill City. And there are the, over like 250 planned housing units within that area, within Mill City, uh, that'll be able to you know, house them afterwards. The problem is that this area drains directly into North Santiam River, which has very high water quality and regulatorily requires very high water quality for the drinking water needs of Salem residents downstream and also in the city of Portland. And so if we don't do anything about all the extra stormwater that's going to be created from new impervious surfaces, the uh, current outfalls that flow directly into North Santan River will be um, overrun. They're, they'll be putting them at risk. And so what we're trying to do is update the storm drainage plan and then install infrastructure, likely natural infrastructure, that will capture and absorb stormwater before it gets to those outfalls. Um, so we're supporting the city in updating the plan, but we're not doing any engineering. That's not what we do here. Um, that'll be done by a to be determined firm, uh, but we're helping with project management, providing stakeholder engagement and fundraising support because we have a lot of experience fundraising for natural infrastructure for communities. Um, because the community is fairly small and they have a really small uh, staff, we are trying to just fit in where um, our capacity is of most use to them. And so a lot of that's just helping out with like RFP development right now. So we're drafting the RFP for engineering services um, and later on we'll be helping them uh, implement the, uh, updating, the plan update as uh, we see what that looks like. And I should note that one of the great benefits of working at a conservation organization like Willamette Partnership, and probably ours in, in particular because we work all throughout Oregon, Washington, is because uh, is that you get to go to amazingly beautiful places all the time. So like that includes, um, you know, personally guided uh, hiking field trips uh, with local experts around like Yacona Bay or Mackenzie River Valley or North Santiam Canyon. And it's just like, it's great that you um, get paid to go to these amazingly beautiful places and learn th things about them. And it's actually for your job and like important. So if, um, if you do apply and you end up um, uh, joining our team, you should be looking forward to multiple fun field trips throughout the state. Lenny? That's great, Ethan. Thank you so much. I'm gonna pass it over to Barton to share about um, who would do well on our team? And Barn, if you could also introduce yourself, your title, and uh, something that you like to do outside of work. Yeah, thanks, Lenny. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm Barton Robison. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I am on the health team here at Wellman Partnership. So um, my work, similarly to Ethan's, kind of takes me around the state, um, but I focus more on the nexus of the effect that a healthy environment has on community health and how we can improve community health equity through improving the environment. Outside of work, uh, I'm very into music. And so I've been going to shows again the last like month, which has been cool. Um, been really into the new Big Thief album and I'm super excited for the new Rosalia album that comes out tomorrow night. Um, so to talk about who, who thrives on our team, I kind of want to frame it as like, who who is going to feel like Willamette Partnership is a really good fit um, for them. And the first part of that is you really got to love collaboration. So this is a picture of me with a bunch of partners out in Chiloquin, Oregon, uh, the ancestral homelands and current administrative center of the Klamath tribes, where in like three months, we will have finished construction on a green schoolyard, uh, which is pretty cool. But my favorite thing about the job is that I get to work with tons of cool people 
all around the state doing things that I would never know about uh, if it weren't for having this job. So no matter which water project you're working on, um, we don't we don't really work as a silo. We're always kind of pulling together different uh, state agencies, federal agencies, community partners. And so the, the person who is gonna do really well here is someone who can do a good job of facilitating those partnerships um, and really likes finding ways to bring out everyone's individual strength and make them feel like they're making a really meaningful contribution to the process. Uh, our executive director put it really beautifully last week where she said, if you were that person who in a group project at school was the one who was like, all right, guys, here's the plan. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. Um, that is probably the type of personality uh, that would be a good fit here. And, and I will also say, too, I want to highlight uh, what Lenny and Emily said earlier. Everyone kind of brings their own different flavor and their own different expertise to it. So know that even though this job in particular seems really broad, um, some of us are more introverted than extroverted. Some of us like me have pretty much no technical knowledge about most of what I work on. Um, but, but that doesn't mean that you can't be a really effective collaborator. Um, another quality you should have is you should connect with our values. Um, and that's just good advice in general for any job you have. But, I think especially here at WP, we spent a lot of time in the last couple of years uh, honing in on those and figuring out um, what really matters to us as people, as individuals, but then also what matters to us collectively when we show up in partnership with folks. And so Emily just posted a link to those on the website. I won't read them out to you, um, but really recommend reading through those um, and making sure that that you connect with them. It feels like, yeah, that's a, the kind of place um, that I would feel good about working and that I could bring those values to my work. And then the third thing I'd mention is it's really important that you care about equity and inclusion, um, partially because uh, we do a lot of collaboration with very diverse populations around the state. So we do work um, in a lot of like really small rural towns in Oregon, which have a super different vibe than if we're doing things with, um, you know, more urban spaces like around Eugene or Salem, which has a really different vibe than if we're working with uh, one of the federally recognized tribes in town. Um, I would also say too that, that almost all of our work at this point takes a pretty explicit equity lens to it. So that's something we're really intentional about building into our work, making sure that we are building a more just future and that we're not just going to those same places that uh, organizations have been working and investing in for a really long time. That we're very thoughtful about who are we including in this process and how can we use um, our work to, to help make a better future uh, for all Oregonians. There's a lot of other stuff, but, uh, but I think that pretty much captures it. Great, thank you so much, Barton. And I think if folks have questions too, they can drop that in the, the Q&A. Um, that was wonderful. Emily, I'm wondering if you can take us home uh, talking about some of the benefits here at Malamit Partnership. Yeah, thanks, Lenny. Um, I just wanted to briefly touch on, you know, kind of circling back to what is it like to be an employee at Willamette Partnership um, and just touch on our benefits a little bit here. Um, besides receiving, you know, sort of the, the medical and dental and 401k and an annual bonus with WP, um, we really emphasize and sort of have ingrained into our work culture this really wonderful flexibility an incredible work-life balance um, culture amongst ourselves. Um, we have a paid time off of about six weeks, which is great, um, but it's a really wonderful feeling to work somewhere where people really value your time and understand when you're gonna hop offline for a personal appointment or take a mental health day, um, especially over the course of the pandemic in these past two years, we've really um, checked in with each other. We've provided different resources through our benefits um, and, you know, made sure that we're all taking the time we need to take care of ourselves and, and do what's best for us. And we really put 
the value of our employees first and recognize that we all have busy lives and have things going on that may disrupt a typical nine to five job. Um, so I can, I think I can speak for the four of us here on this call that we all really feel that level of respect and trust with Willamette Partnership. And um, we just really wanted to emphasize that today that we, we all really love and care about this work and, and feel valued here. Um, so with that, I will pass it over to Lenny for some Q&A. Great. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, okay, I'm going to close my screen share here. Um, and it looks like we have a couple of questions. Feel free to add any more if you have them. Um, I'm I'm going to direct this to you first, Ethan, and then if anyone else wants to jump in, please feel free. But um, this question asks, for the Aquina Bay project and others like it, how do you provide data assistance? Do you perform the analyses or do you interpret the analyses from other stakeholders? It's a good question. Um, I mean, it depends on the project. Uh, with regards to Yaquina Bay, um, we are not doing the data analysis or all the mapping. Um, that is being done by the Institute for Public Research and Engagement out of University of Oregon, who are our project partners on it, and they are phenomenally talented when it comes to uh, GIS skills. Um, I know two of us on team uh, can do GIS mapping, um, uh, Emily and I. It's I don't think that we are at like spatial uh, analysis scale quality, um, but we like um, like for a lot of projects, like I'll create maps in order to like help ground people on like where they're at. And so you do a lot of map making whenever it, in terms of uh, stakeholder engagement or trying to describe a, an issue or a problem that's occurring there. Like we can like pull in, in uh, input from stakeholders into mapping products easily, but in terms of doing like really heavy duty uh, spatial analysis um, that's required for some projects, that's not really gonna be something that we'll be doing. We'll usually um, uh, just partner with a really skilled uh, group for that, like University of Oregon. Um, yeah. And the, uh, Emily, do you want to add anything like that? You were the uh, you're the GIS expert, GIS expert before I came on board. Oh, I don't know if I'd use the word expert, but thank you, Ethan. No, I think you're right. And one of the great things too is, like you mentioned, we are, you know, working with partners to find those skill sets that maybe we may not have on our team, and that just broadens our reach even further. So, great. Yeah, and and the last thing I'll add is. Um, you know, when it comes to data analysis, there's so many different ways, there's so many kinds of data and so many different ways to analyze it. And so I think echoing what Ethan said, it really depends on the project and it depends on the expertise or the knowledge we have. A lot of times we contract out if it's really technical. Um, but a lot of analysis that I see we do is qualitative analysis, um, whether that be on interviews or looking at doing policy scans. Um, gathering a lot of information and then sharing it with stakeholders to make decisions on. So a lot of facilitating data, um, helping to interpret data, but maybe not doing the, the technical data analysis per se. But if that is a skill set that that a higher brings, I think that is also something we, we could potentially use as well. Um, okay, so the next question is, uh, what happens if I, as a Willamette Partnership employee, know of designs that will assist the engineers, land use planning and policies that could create passive stormwater designs. And, you know, I'll take a first stab at that. I think that that's great. And I think that you can use that information to share with the stakeholders. I think, Ethan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but part of what you're doing, for example, at Yaquina Bay is gathering that kind of information, gathering creating network maps of people you could potentially reach out to and some ideas as well. Um, how would you respond to that question? Um, and similarly, I mean, it's great. It's great that you have uh, not personal knowledge of, you know, passive stormwater designs, green infrastructure mm -hmm. designs, things like that. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things like that helps you um, like having that uh, experience 
having that knowledge allows you to better choose uh, an engineering firm to provide perform like the more detailed analysis and like you know prelim and understand what preliminary designs actually look mean and what they're functioning as um, and that's a huge benefit to have in this role uh, we have a few people on staff who have uh, you know, fairly deep uh, experience with natural infrastructure. Um, like I would never design natural infrastructure, but I've looked at a lot of plans and I know what, you know, what to look for for certain things. Um, and I think, yeah, having that would be a big benefit. Great, thanks. Um, and Ethan, a lot of these questions I, I'm sending to you because you do a lot of the work with Infrastructure Next, including this next one. Um, and I think this relates to the first question. What technical skills are critical to this position? Um, I would say understanding how infrastructure gets planned and implemented at a very basic level is, uh, it's not necessarily like a hard skill, but it is like a, a, a piece of knowledge that is beneficial for this. Um, these are things you can learn along the way. So it's not like a, a requirement, but um, so for instance, I'm an urban planner. I have an urban planning background, went to grad school for it. so. This type of stuff I kind of got trained in in some in some sense and like how local policies work, um, how things get codified. Um, what do you want in a complete streets plan? What was you know green infrastructure? How does that get implemented at the private uh, side and at the public's uh, right of way scale? And I would say, you know, other technical skills is really around policy change and um, administra administrative implementation. That's something that as an organization, we do have some expertise in across several staff members and it's a huge benefit. And if you have that, we'd love to, love to talk to you, but that's by no means like the only piece of technical expertise that'd be valuable. Yeah, great. And I think um, this is not technical expertise, but having experience working with uh, rural communities, with municipalities, um with small government local government i think that is really will be really helpful in this role in particular um okay i'm going to pass this question over to barton um do we partner with other nonprofits? and if so could you give us a couple examples i'll let you oh, start do we oh my gosh we partner with everyone <laughs> no it's uh honestly it would be like take me hours to think through everyone that we have some connection with on the project. So sometimes it's a really close partnership. Um, in the, the Chiloquin Green Schoolyard project I mentioned earlier, like we worked really closely with the tribes, we worked really closely with Trust for Public Land. Um, but I don't know, at the local level, like here in Portland, I know Vinny does some work with Verde. Um, we do work with a bunch of like other environmental nonprofit e types. Um, more so, I would say the nonprofits is probably like state agencies on the water side. And I guess Ethan and Lenny, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like it's more local and state level governments um, with some feds. But, but especially like community based organizations and those kinds of nonprofits, um, we, we have pretty regular contact with and, and pretty deep relationships around the state uh, from a variety of like environmental health uh, type sectors. Yeah, and and I, you know, we're pretty unique in that we have a health team. So both Barton and I are part of the health team and, and we get to help bring um, a health lens to a lot of the water work too, especially if we're talking in a group or, or brainstorming. And um, that really means working with community organizations, community-based organizations that are trusted in that community to understand what some of those um, community wellness priorities are. Um, so it, it's really important that we, we partner with those folks and, um, and it's one of my favorite parts of the work that I do. Just to, to touch on Maria's follow-up question too, it really depends on the project as to how we do like broad public community engagement. So sometimes uh, it, it is broad and it's directly with the public, uh, but, but more often than not, it's specific to an organization um, or usually a suite of organizations that represent the community in various interests there. Um, and like Lenny said, community engagement is uh, probably my favorite part of the job. Great, thank you. 
Um, okay, another question is, I have four years of combined post-grad and professional experience. Should I still apply even though the job posting states a minimum of five years? Very excited about the position. Uh, this is a great question. You know, when we talked about writing a job description and what we're looking for, a lot of times uh, putting together a number like that is how things have typically been done. And I think we're trying to get at um, someone that has experience in the field already. Um, we put a number of, of five years as a measure of, you know, having some experience working in this already. Um, but I would say that, you know, it really depends on what kind of work you've been doing and how directly it relates. And I think if you know, those four years of mixed experience has given you a lot of background, um, has given you a lot of uh, perspective or ideas. Um, I would not have that five year, is this okay if I'm saying this, Emily, correct me if I'm wrong. I would not have that five years stop you because it is, uh, it's more of like a guiding light than it is a hard and fast rule. Yeah, and if I recall, Lenny, we had said that even grad, it would be included in that, you know, that experience with your education, the projects you're doing, you know, with professors or with other students, that can also be considered experience. So I wouldn't limit, you know, your post-grad experience to just what's applying for this job. Um, so yes, definitely still apply. Um, like, like Ethan mentioned, this is kind of a job where it's flexible and we want to see who who applies and how it's going to fit into our skill sets and what we already have and what projects we want to work on. So definitely apply and, and see if it's a good fit. Okay, thanks Emily. Okay, there's a really great question here and maybe I can have everyone kind of go around, um, but uh, any job organization has its frustration and challenges. You have all done a great job of, sh of sharing why WP is awesome, but what are some of the things that frustrate you about your roles or your job? How do you deal with that individually and as a team? Does anyone want to volunteer to take that first? So I don't put anyone on the spot. Okay, Ethan, okay. thank you. <laughs> um, so because because we work with communities, uh, that means that we end up working with within political systems and people who are uh, either, you know, um, either elected officials or uh, work at, you know, the request or of an elected official. Uh, so like at will employee kind of thing. Um, and because of that, you know, there's a lot of concern about uh, that, you know, something that some a project that we're working on may end up having a negative consequence for you know a political outcome and so it can be a little tricky sometimes to sort of navigate that fortunately mm -hmm. we have a lot of in-house expertise in dealing with that um, and whenever an issue pops up we sort of bring it to the entire team and as a group we basically like tackle like, okay, this is what's going to happen and like other staff will sort of run interference and things like that and talk to other people and sort of navigate these issues. So like, while at times you can be kind of like, oh my God, what's going on? Then you realize, oh, it's fine. Like, it's just, uh, you know, it's a typical situation. This is how it usually plays out, et cetera. Um, and I'd say uh, that's really kind of led from, uh, from the top. Uh, our executive director is uh, very adept at um, uh, understanding all the different like dynamics at play within the sort of the water community throughout the state of Oregon and Washington. And uh, there's a lot of help. Thanks, Ethan. Barn or Emily, do either of you want to answer that question? What What are some of the things that are challenging about working at WP or about your job? I'm probably the wrong person to ask because I, I feel like literally every day I have to pinch myself and be like, oh my gosh, how did you get this job? Um, which is like authentic. I'm not just saying that. Uh, I really, really love it. Um, one thing that has been challenging for me in the past is like grant writing, fundraising work. Um, I know it's a skill you have to build, but when I came in, I didn't have that skill. And so getting used to the fact of like, oh, I actually have to do like some fundraising for my position was sort of hard to wrap my brain around. Um, but I will also say, we are so much better with our internal systems um, and internal collaboration around that stuff now. And it's super helpful to have um, some, some pretty 
big pots of steady funding, um, especially on the water side that uh, really help us be able to plan out for the next three or five years. Okay, this is kind of the money that we've got. These are the kinds of projects we're gonna work on. And this is when we need to do other stuff. Um, but I, I do remember that being something that caused me anxiety when I started. Great, thanks. Okay. Um, someone asked, does Willamette Partnerships water and collaborative goals reflect and align with Oregon's 100 year water vision or Oregon's integrated water resources planning and place-based planning or a little bit of both? Um, I will just say that one of the projects we're working on is um, working with Oregon Water Futures uh, collaborative team. Um, which is a, a, a group of BIPOC-led CBOs, University of Oregon um, uh, Institute for Racial and Climate Justice, um, Oregon Environmental Council and Alignment Partnership. And uh, we have been working on building out a water justice um, policy framework based on community conversations with uh, BIPOC community members across the state of Oregon. There was a lot of outreach in 2019 and 2020 in collaboration with um, trusted CBOs. And we're doing a little bit more outreach this, this spring, but that initiative really came out of the 100 year water vision um, because there was a note that, you know, who are there people missing that should have been engaged in this project? We think yes. And um, can we do some water justice work to, to reach out to those communities? So uh, we do kind of have a project that we're working on that is in a, kind of a, an offshoot of the 100 year water vision. And as we're building this like water justice framework, we are hoping that it gets incorporated into whatever the 100 year water vision turns into um, or the update to the integrated water resources planning as well as place-based planning. So we're hoping that like, those findings, those recommendations do get incorporated and um, hoping to be a part of that. Uh, and Ethan, do you have any other comments on, on like our vision of water? Um, not exactly with regards to this question. I mean, yeah. Lenny, your work around uh, Oregon Water Futures is just awesome. Um, I'm very jealous Thanks. that I can't, that, you know, you can work <laughs> on it, I don't. Yeah, it is. But, I feel um, really, really lucky. Um, okay. What, if anything, does Willamette Partnership do in addressing the increasing drought here in the Northwest um, and dealing with fire prevention and response? I think that's a great question. I, you know, as part of our strategic plan, um, which I think is on our website and available. We have been talking a lot more about um, climate impacts and building resiliency. And, and we can't have that conversation without talking about drought and without talking about fire. Um, and so some of the, the projects that Ethan's working on, those are fire impacted communities and really working to, to rebuild that community in a way that prepares for future climate impacts, but also builds healthy, vibrant communities that have good environment around them, that have good health outcomes. Um, so I would say that's a really big part of what we hope to do and what we hope to grow in the future. Same with drought work, I would say. Um, my dogs are about to start barking outside. Uh, any, anything else to add to that, Ethan? Um, yeah, so we're only just now starting to do um, uh, place-based work uh, around wildfire, especially right now with uh, you know recovery from wildfire um with regards to preparation for it and um you know the drought issues um this is also you know inherently connected with climate change and as an organization we're trying to take a very thoughtful approach to what is the what's the the niche that we're filling within this region with regards to climate change because we know that we have a lot of partners and friends that do work around climate change with all these different ecosystems and part and uh, locations. And we just wanna make sure that when we step into it, that we're doing it in a way in which we can really be there for a long time and have a big impact. And so that's something we're actively thinking about. And we have meetings about fairly regularly. Um, 
And uh, we just had one like uh, about two weeks ago, uh, helping us think this through. And it's something that, you know, if this person uh, who starts has an interest and really good ideas, um, you know, these are the kind of things that you can kind of figure out what you want on your plate over time. Okay, thanks, Ethan. Okay, so there's so many great questions here. I know it's 515. Um, we'll answer one more question and then all the other questions we haven't answered. I think Emily has a really good idea of, uh, we'll make like a, a Q and A document on our website and we'll, we'll answer those questions there. Um, but I love ending on this question. Um, they ask, if you are wildly successful with this hire, how do you see the organization changing over the next five years? And um, I'm going to direct this question to Barton. <laughs> as soon as you read that, I thought of uh, that part in the office where Michael Scott is a kid. And when they ask what he wants to do when he grows up, he says he wants to have 100 kids so he can have 100 friends. <laughs> and no one can say no to being his friend. Uh, yeah, uh, and honestly, like I, I think we would grow. Um, I think that's what it would mean. It, it is just like a special place, and the role that we play, especially as like an extra governmental organization, and being able to bridge all these gaps um, between government agencies, between communities and government, um, between conflicting communities. Um, I just don't really see anywhere else. And so I think if we are wildly successful with this, and we can keep finding more people who, uh, who share our values, um, who fit our vibe and who have the same commitments that we do, um, I, I would love to see us get bigger and, and be able to help more people. Great, so no one can say no to be my friend. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Barton. Thank you all so much for your great questions and for being engaged today. Thanks for folks who are watching the recording. Um, we'll answer these questions and post it on our website. Uh, we'll try to get that by the end of the week. Um, I think that seems doable. We hope you all have a great rest of your afternoon. If you have any follow-up questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to us directly. Um, and any way that we can help increase transparency or make this process easier for you, uh, we'd love to chat. So thank you all so much. Have a wonderful evening and hope to see you soon. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.